here to hear John Gibbler, and he is talking to us tonight from Mexico City, where he lives. And he is speaking on, or the, the name of our, our, our experience tonight is Mexico, Accountability for Mass Kidnappings and Disappearances. And as John reminded me just before our, um, um, our session tonight, it's really, he's gonna be talking about the lack of accountability, especially focused on the 43 young college students uh, who were disappeared in Ayotzinapa, Mexico. So um, that's why we're here. And I, um, some of you have been here before. We will um, introduce our speaker and, and he will give us a presentation. And we hope that you will have questions and comments. And as they come up along the way, um, feel very free to put them in the chat. It won't distract him because um, he, uh, someone else will be gathering those together and um, Jennifer will. And when it's time for question, answer, discussion, um, uh, Jennifer will be giving those questions to John. Um, usually this is the time when I invite you um, to come to our next session, but this is the last in a series of five um, uh, from January to May. Um, and um, we've been very happy um, to be able to provide information and food for thought um, on many different areas of Latin America and issues related to it. Um, we have been doing this kind of a series for many years now, and um, stay tuned. We, uh, you'll be on our emailing list, and we will let you know um, what comes next. But right now, I think we're taking the summer off in terms of sessions. So um, I would like to just also mention that um, this is an event of Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice here in Washtenaw County, uh, Michigan. And we have two co-sponsors. Um, one is the University of Michigan's Latin America and Caribbean Studies uh, Department, who have uh, very generously co-sponsored us. And the second is the Huron Valley, which is our watershed where we live here in Ann Arbor, the Huron Valley Democratic Socialists of America. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Rich stoller -Shoak who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Marianne, and thanks, John, for agreeing to be with us. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, we're especially delighted to end up our series today with what's going to be a very powerful set of reflections on the situation in Mexico about which we hear uh, not enough and not the right things uh, here on this side of the Rio Grande. Um, uh, many of you know that um, the issue of uh, accountability or lack thereof uh, doesn't know any borders. We just recently had a former occupant of the White House um, with the justice nipping at his heels from various directions um, who uh, boasted that he could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and not have to bear the consequences. So uh, uh, for many of us, this is a problem uh, of democracy uh, in general. And um, John has specialized in that set of issues and in the um, uh, particular variant of uh, corruption and lack of accountability in Mexico, the narco-political violence and the militarized lack of accountability, as he put it a few minutes ago, um, in uh, Mexico. John is a journalist, author, um, and um, activist who lives in Mexico, writes from Mexico, and um, has written a number of books, including one on the so-called drug wars, uh, To Die in Mexico, and um, one about a case that he's going to be uh, saying more about in a few minutes, uh, the case in 2014 of the forced disappearance um, of 43 students at a teacher's college in Ayotzinapa uh, in the state of Guerrero in Southwest Mexico. Um, and uh, that book is called, I Couldn't Even Imagine That They Would Kill Us, an oral history of the attacks against the students of Ayotzinapa. Um, so uh, we are uh, 
Um, yeah, very uh, honored and will be very enlightened to have John's reflections on this uh, sobering topic, which has a lot of relevance, again, beyond just Mexico, but also uh, here in the United States as well. John is no stranger to Ann Arbor. He's been here uh, uh, in the past to, uh, to give a talk and um, we're delighted to have him back in virtual format, at least uh, on this uh, forum. So uh, thank you and welcome, John, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Rich, Marianne, um, Jennifer, and Tera, and everyone at the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you and with everyone who's, who's joined us. Um, a bit of an apology in advance for the image. I, I, accidentally somehow messed up my camera lens the other day trying to clean it, I think. And so if it's a bit blurry enough for the light here is just odd, but that that is why that is such um, my apologies. Uh, I'd like to, to, to speak and share with you all uh, several, a lot of information and some reflections about um, the case of the 43 disappeared students from IOT Napa. And just as a way of a kind of, uh, uh, warning or or uh, aviso um, at the beginning. There's just so much information and details are incredibly important. Background and context is incredibly important, but for the time limit tonight and to be able to talk about things that have happened very recently and are probably less known, um, uh, I'm going to skip a lot of really essential information, um, the background to the school, um, why the students were out in Iguala that night gathering buses, um, um, uh, political history of the state of Guerrero in Southern Mexico, um, a lot of things uh, that we can go into and, and address later in the kind of question answer conversation part of the evening. Um, but just as a kind of letting you know at the beginning for people who are less familiar with these events um, that, that I'll be skipping over in the interest of, of time, a lot of really important information. But uh, if, if something strikes you as, as, as uh, needing addressing, uh, please note it in, in the comments and, and we can get into it. Um, and thus jumping right in, uh, I've got, I initially made like nine pages of typed notes, which is uh, incredibly irresponsible. So I turned them into two pages of handwritten notes. That's what I'll be constantly uh, looking at. <laughs> over here to try and keep me on track and um, uh, somewhat keep in check my tendency for digression and micro histories. Um, on September 26, 27, 2014, in uh, the Southern Mexican state of Guerrero, the town and surrounding areas of Iguala, um, five commercial, tourist buses, commercial buses of students from the Rural Teachers College of Ayotzinapa, um, and a sixth bus completely unrelated to the students carrying a youth soccer team from Chilpancingo that had just had a soccer game in Iguala, they won, um, were attacked between the hours of 8.30 at night and 4.35 in the morning. Um, the attacks killed six people, including three students, wounded scores, and 43 Ayotzinapa students were forcibly disappeared. Um, the first, I'm going to kind of unravel this as it was appearing at the time, like the first information that came out, um, via news websites and so on. That's how I first saw it. You know, there were other people who maybe heard on the radio and so on. But uh, the initial, uh, within hours of these attacks on the morning of September 27, 2014, I saw a headline in the La Jornada newspaper that said 57 Ayotzinapa students disappeared, six people killed, uh, clashes between police and students in Iguala. Right? Um, that initial number was largely due to the chaos of, of the attacks and the events that night and the fact that it, a number of students, 14, um, were on a different bus that uh, those 14 students were able to escape and run off and, and hide in the countryside 
um, during the course of that night, they were pursued and shot at several points, but all 14 students on that bus, which we'll get to maybe in a bit more detail, survived and were hidden. And there was con thus confusion the next morning as to the number of, of students who had been disappeared by police. Um, that number very quickly within hours uh, was 43. Um, but the initial information was, uh, was, I mean, 43, 57, just shocking. Um, and uh, the Ayusinapa students had been targeted by state repression even very recently in 2012. Two students were shot and killed by police during a highway blockade protest. Um, a long history of protests and repression. Uh, but even in the context of that history, this was unprecedented, shocking, overwhelming. Um, and in the following days, there was an incredible amount of confusion. Um, you know, the students themselves didn't realize that their classmates, the survivors, didn't realize their classmates had been disappeared until hours into the next morning because they saw their classmates being detained by uniformed police officers physically submitted, put into official marked police vehicles and taken away. So the assumption was they've been arrested, right? Um, and it wasn't until hours later when families and students would go looking for the 43 classmates at the local jail and finding no one there and no one giving any answers and the people at the local jail lying, the judge lying, the police lying, everybody in any official capacity from the very first moments lying, um, then the kind of shock and horror even dawned on the survivors and the families themselves that, oh no, this is a disappearance. Um, and a very you know particular Latin America has a unique history. There's, the practice has been used in regions across the world, but forced disappearance, agents of the state abducting somebody, um, taking them to an undisclosed location, right? And then of course, lying about uh, the abduction, lying about the location, the person, everything. Um, all of the kind of classic elements of state terror referred to as forced disappearance um, were present in what took place in Iguala on September 26, 27, 2014. So within these first few hours and then days, there's incredible amount of confusion. Um, Local and state officials and federal officials all took advantage of that confusion and either lied about what had happened, what was still ongoing, the fact that the students weren't being found, weren't being located, um, or lied or emphasized the lack of importance, the non-political nature of the violence. There are a whole series of, of discursive strategies, everything from straight up lying to saying, oh no, the students, they were just running and terrified. Look, you know, those 14 that came back and they've been hiding out in the hills. Oh, well, all the other 43 are also surely hiding out somewhere. And little by little, they're gonna trickle back into town and get back in touch with their families. State officials said stuff like this. I directly heard it. I was there reporting on the events as of October 3rd, um, saying that, you know, that one state police officer who was at a scene where a series of mass graves had been uncovered on October 4th, told me directly, 17 of the bodies in these mass graves belong to the students, the rest are on their way home, right? The patent line, neither of those two things were true. The 28 bodies that were recovered from those mass graves belonged to other people. None of those bodies uh, were any of the disappeared 43 students. And of course, none of them had returned home that day. Um, so there's, you know, the, the state, all levels of officials, the mayor was lying and saying, no, I didn't know anything was even happening. Everything was peaceful last night in Iguala. Um, federal officials saying things like, um, oh, you know, this is a state issue. The feds aren't going to get involved. It's, you know, it's a, it's must be related to drug trafficking and organized crime, which ironically is a federal crime. Um, but in these first Days and weeks, there was all this chaos, confusion, and officials on all levels taking advantage of it and uh, continuing to sow confusion, lie, and spread misinformation. That was when I uh, you know, traveled to the region and started interviewing 
eyewitnesses, survivors, um, family members, uh, anyone I could I could speak with, but very much focusing, especially early on, and and interviewing students who had been in the streets of Iguala that night and, sur and survived the attack. So they were direct survivors and eyewitnesses to everything that had taken place. And very quickly, within the first round of about four or five interviews, I realized that everything that seemed to be known about the attacks, except the fact that it was police attacking students, which is true, um, was inaccurate. You know, there's there was one location in the city that everybody was talking about. It turns out the students had been attacked at distinct locations simultaneously throughout hours, right? So there was initially assumed to be one location of mass force disappearance, which is this Juan and Alvarez and Periferico intersection. And it turns out that there were two entirely distinct mass scenes of forced disappearance, Juan and Alvarez, and ironically, in front of the state courthouse, El Palacio de Justicia. Um, in Iguala. Then there's also this other bus of students who were stopped by federal police and were able to escape. Um, but so early on, there's this, I mean, there's just the shock of the events, then all the confusion, the lies, um, false information being leaked to journalists, especially op-ed writers. So op-ed writers publishing all kinds of op-eds without citing any sources, uh, speculating on what had, what had happened. With every rumor possible, the students were had been infiltrated by a rival cartel, um, and that's why they were attacked. The students went to boycott a political event of this narco power couple in town, the mayor and his wife, and that's why they were attacked. Um, all of these things uh, would be shown to be absolutely untrue, but they had been initially spread through uh, a lot of op-eds appearing in, you know, columnists writing in, in media, both locally and nationally. Um, and within weeks, you know, the first kind of major government action was to show these mass graves and send the remains off to, uh, to be analyzed. Um, for DNA analysis to see if they pertain to any of the 43 students, which took several weeks. And during those several weeks, what we now know, of course, is that that's when the federal government took over the case and orchestrated a massive cover-up operation, um, which I hesitate, or I, I jump in to um, emphasize that when you're talking about forced disappearance, the state forcibly disappearing someone, the act of covering up um, takes on the dimension of the forced disappearance itself, right? Because it's the state uniformed members, and we will come to learn that it was police from three different municipalities, state police, federal police, uh, army soldiers, um, all in constant communication with each other, orchestrating, coordinating, and carrying out these attacks and the forced disappearance. So when the administrative uh, agents of the Federal Attorney General's Office, the President's Office, the National Security Council, and so on, as well as the Marines and the Army, um, jump in to lie, to torture people into producing false confessions, to inventing a false crime scene. Um, that act of covering up what actually happened becomes, I think it's my argument, constitutive of forced disappearance itself, because you're making it impossible to find the students. You're making it impossible to find accurate information about what happened and impossible to find their whereabouts. So thus, the state that's responsible for physically disappearing them, then these administrative agents come in, I believe, become responsible for the administration of that disappearance, administratively continuing the disappearance. Um, so, you know, people familiar with the case will know that there was this, in late October, initial um, uh, media press conferences held by the federal government, media events to present their theory of what had happened. And again, I mean, note it, like look at the timeline. The students were disappeared on 26, 27 September. Um, on October 4th, there was this discovery of mass graves outside of Iguala. 28 bodies were recovered. They were sent to uh, be analyzed. And the analysis came back 20 something days later. Um, 
showing that none of those human remains pertain to any of the 43 students. And within days, uh, the federal government comes out with this story that they will tell. It will, it will come later, become known later as the historical truth, because during the press conference when the federal attorney general at the time, Jesus Murillo Karam, was talking about uh, describing their theory of the case, which we know, of course, was a lie and was invented. Um, he called it, he said, this is la verdad histórica de lo que pasó, right? This is the historical truth of what happened. And um, as a, a way of, of mocking the, the attempt to hide the truth through state actions, their entire operation became known widely as la verdad histórica, or the historical truth, a very Orwellian series of discursive events because you know now la verdad histórica, the historical truth, is used to refer to one of the most exhaustive, complex, expensive governmental lies in Mexican history. Um, so in late October, October 28th, 29th, uh, 2014, the government initially says, okay, you know, we've detained these people who are the perpetrators. The police uh, grabbed the students. Um, they only mentioned the one location of forced disappearance. In fact, the entire four years of that government investigation only considered this one location. The entire other location of mass forced disappearance was not even mentioned in the, you know, 86,000 pages of the case file. Um, and that, you know, they contradicted themselves, sometimes saying that the students had gone to boycott this political event. And that's why they were attacked. Sometimes they said the students had been infiltrated or got mixed up with a rival cartel. And that's why they've been attacked. Um, but that what had happened was police stopped the students, turned them over, very important distinction, because it's to lead us away from acknowledging and recognizing the extent to which state security forces themselves are organized crime. So if we think that the police grab the students and then turn them over to hitmen, it maintains this myth of distinction between organized crime and state security forces. And so they turn them over to the hitmen and these hitmen took the students out to a trash dump. Some of them had already died because they piled all 43 of them together in one vehicle. So some of them suffocated according to the story. And then over a single night, starting around midnight and going until three or four in the afternoon the next day, this ragtag group of local hitmen incinerated the 43 human bodies, right? Didn't burn them. I mean, this is the state's own explanation, incinerated them because they say that they put the ash into trash bags, took the ash to a, a nearby river, dumped six of the trash bags out like this and then just threw the last two in. And those last two, one was found. And of that one trash bag that was found, one single piece of incinerated human bone was located that was able to be submitted to DNA analysis. Very importantly, you know, immediately this would all seem just completely untenable because there was no chain of custody for those operations. There was no documentation to say, this is who, this is the state agent that found the trash bag. This is exactly where it was. Here are the photographs of the trash bag at this location. Here are the photographs of the people opening it. Here are the photographs of the people documenting what's there. None of that existed. When independent forensic anthropologists from the Argentine anthropology team came to uh, observe the area where supposedly these human remains had just been found, and were, they arrive and find everything laid out on a table, right? And immediately, these are people who've been doing this, they're world experts in forensics anthropology. Immediately, they said, you know, there was one piece of bone, charred bone, that looked completely different from everything else. And this would be the one piece of bone that would later be submitted to DNA analysis at a specialized laboratory in Innsbruck, Austria, and positively identified as pertaining to one of the 43 students, Alexander Mora Benanti. So immediately, this story just it just simply didn't make sense. It turns out that it rained all that night. So wait, how are you going to have these people incinerating, not just burning, incinerating 43 human bodies in a single night in an open air trash dump in a rainstorm? It didn't make sense. And so like immediate 
um, just kind of basic reporting activity, me and several colleagues, you know, we went to Kokula, we went to Iguala, we found the trash dump workers, who it turns out said that they went and dumped the trash on the morning of September, September 27th. Nobody was there. The roads were really wet, so they went later in the day to try to give them time to dry. Um, it turns out they also told us that the army had been blocking off that trash dump for several weeks um, and wouldn't let the municipal trash workers dump any trash there anymore. Um, and, you know, a series of just immediately uh, questionable um, features of this story, you know, the videos that the government released of the supposed hitmen who confessed to these crimes, there were visible, literally visible traces of torture on their bodies, like there were wounds that were still healing um, in these videotaped supposed confessions, as well as just like behavior. They were all constantly twitching and fidgeting. And I mean, and some of them even, it would turn out later, in the complete version of those videos, talk about being tortured, right? That wasn't included in the Federal Attorney General's initial press conference, but later when those full videos would be released to the public and access, they themselves talk about being tortured. So you had, you know, the supposed uh, perpetrators having been tortured, um, just the basic features of the story not making sense, incinerating 43 bodies in a single night during a rainstorm and so on. Uh, but the government absolutely buckled down refused to move on uh, on any elements of their story. This is this is the historical truth of what happened that night, they said. Um, through a very uh, ingenious, uh, I think brilliant political initiative um, that some of the human, local human rights organizations in Mexico thought up, the families of the disappeared students asked for the Mexican government to accept a technical assistance, an, uh, you know, an expert technical assistance um, from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to aid in the investigation. And the government, they signed this uh, agreement sometime, I'm fudging now on the exact date, but late November, early December of 2014. So at a time when there were mass protests going on all around Mexico, the events had horrified people, galvanized an entire nation, just like there's a, you know, there's a generation of people who are marked by January 1, 1994, and like taking to the streets and, and getting involved in protests, you know, in Mexico, as well as in, in, in communities across the world, um, as a result of the Zapatista uprising, and then of course the repression, and then the mobilizations to stop the war. Um, there was an entire generation here in Mexico that was mobilized by these events, this mass forced disappearance of students and took to the streets in mass numbers across the country, participating in all kinds of solidarity activities, demanding that the students be uh, presented alive and that the full truth of what happened that night be known. Um, and in that moment of, of, of weakness, the state signed this agreement the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights appointed a panel of experts of five uh, international people, uh, former uh, attorneys general, um, experts in uh, human rights law, experts in um, psycho psychology and attention to uh, survivors, um, and formed this extremely competent panel of five people who came to technically assist the government. This is what would become known as in for its Spanish initials as the HIE. G-I-E-I. -E um, and they arrived in March 2015, conducted six months of investigation, and published a first report. And in their first report, they completely dismantled the government's uh, attempted cover-up, right? The government's official description of the events. They showed with forensic fire analysis how a fire of that scale was not possible in that location, how that fire had not taken place in that location. These initial expert anal fire analyses would later be supported like two years later by this exhausted document produced by the Argentine anthropology team, um, like documenting literally square inch by square inch that a fire of that nature incinerating human remains had not taken place in that location on that date. Um, and 
also in the in this initial expert report, the HIE report, they showed that the military was in the streets and was involved at several locations throughout the night, which is something the government had been uh, refusing to acknowledge, still tries to acknowledge, tries not to acknowledge, or we'll come to that. Um, that federal police had been involved, that you know, municipal police from three different municipalities had been involved, that indeed the detainees had all been tortured. Um, and uh, and initially, you know, they they of course talked about they documented the different distinct locations at which the students had been attacked. And they documented the five buses that the students uh, had been aboard, and particularly what they called the fifth bus, which was this one particular bus that 14 students had been on and were able to flee from and escape. That is the only bus that night that was stopped by federal police. It's the only bus that all this that was never shot at. Not a single shot was fired at that bus. It's the only bus that all the students got off and escaped and survived, all 14. It's the only bus that was escorted by federal police around the blockades where at that moment police were attacking and about to forcibly disappear students off of another bus, call it say the fourth bus. The federal police guided this fifth bus around the blockade and sent it on its way. Right? And it turns out the government lied about the existence of that bus from the very beginning until it was impossible because the, the expert panel found video footage from the bus station showing that bus as it exited the bus station. Of course, there were the students' testimonies. They were also able to find a handwritten affidavit that the bus driver wrote when he arrived at his destination in Morelos State, where he described everything that had just happened in Iguala. It turns out that original handwritten signed document by the bus driver completely coincides with everything the students told me as a reporter and later the investigators, right? Completely close sides. The fact that they grabbed the bus at the bus station, went around the city on the periferico, got there late, stopped when they saw another bus surrounded by police, were apprehended by, by federal police. 14 students got off and fled. Federal police led that bus around the city and off to Cocula. The government lied and lied and lied. And finally, when the experts demanded to see that bus, they showed them a different bus, right? <laughs> and it was very easy to like look at these images from the bus station and look at the bus they were saying was this same bus and say, it's not the same. I mean, look like the, you know, uh, inspection stickers literally on the, on the driver's windshield were different. Things like that, that were just immediate and easy to see. The upholstery on that was visible on the bus seats was totally different. Um, but because the government so, uh, consistently, forcibly lied about everything having to do with that bus. The investigator said, huh, what if the, some kind of part of the motive that the students were attacked had something to do with the buses themselves? They start investigating and it turns out there's a history of trafficking heroin from Iguala. Guerrero is at that point was the largest herring producing region in the hemisphere. And this, as everybody knows, from following the opioid scandals and the disasters of fentanyl and everything that's been happening in the US for 20 years now, 2014 is like the peak boom of heroin consumption in the US. It's when they're starting to restrict access to a lot of the opioid pills and people are coming out of the clinics, not being able to get their pills and they're buying cheap, excellent quality heroin right there. Um, so this is a, a moment in geopolitical history when the commodity value of precisely the illegal commodity that's mostly grown in the state of Guerrero was as it, at its top. We're talking like, like tens of millions of dollars a week in cash, sending these shipments of heroin from Guerrero to the United States. Well, it turns out the independent experts um, uh, asked the federal government for any information about this drug trafficking. So it turns out there was a court case in Chicago that they were able to access for free because it's public information and later reach out to the DEA for uh, wiretaps that they had on people involved in this drug trafficking organization from Guerrero to Chicago and so on. The government in Mexico just completely drugged their feet and uh, lied and refused to participate in 
further investigating that potential hypothesis. Just looking at the clock and realizing that once again, of course, I've gotten through like half a page of two and what should have been the time. So somehow I'm gonna try to speed up. Um, and then in conversation, we can get it more. But, but this was an attempt to quickly, briefly paint some kind of a sketch of the scale of what had happened that night and also the scale of government complicity in not investigating what actually happened, but trying to uh, create a, a fabrication, a lie, a cover-up, and just smash it down people's throats. Um, after two terms, there's more and really like kind of jaw-dropping information that these investigators would, would uh, come to and reveal in their second report, but they published their second report in April 2016, and the Mexican government refused to renew their contract, thus elegantly kicking them out of the country, um, expelling them. And so that experience with the Inter-American Commission, these independent experts, lasted two six-month terms and then was gone. Um, and once it was gone, the government here just completely, you know, closed down its ranks and just repeated the same lies over and over for four years um, until they were, or for two more years, right? It was four total, until they were out of office. So when the current president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, is campaigning in Mexico, he's, you know, of course, presenting himself not as just an opposition candidate, but as the like quintessential opposition candidate, as the kind of incarnate, almost messianic embodiment of everything that opposes uh, corruption and the pre, even though that's where he was you know, politically formed for decades in Tabasco, but he's presenting himself as this personification of opposition. Like I'm opposed to everything that these people have been. And so when during a, a campaign event in Iguala, when the families of the 43 disappeared students took the stage, they didn't ask for permission. And very importantly, AMLO didn't reach out to them either. They marched up on stage and then AMLO was like, okay, let's listen. And they said, make some commitment to us to actually investigate what happened and to find our, our sons, right? And so right there on that stage, he did. And this is hugely important for a number of reasons. One, this was the only explicit, not only commitment, but even acknowledgement of mass human rights atrocities that have been taking place across the country in the context of the so-called drug war, right? Starts with Felipe Calderon, 2006, up to the present. And so this is a country that had been submerged in like untold forms of mass cruelty and mass violence, mutilations, massacres, mass forced disappearance, and this single only event, because horrifyingly Ayotzinapa is not an isolated event at all, that the president committed to addressing, investigating, and solving, because he said he would, uh, was Ayotzinapa. And so this is on the campaign trail. He's elected. His election, without a doubt, was probably the single most popular, like legitimate popular vote in modern, in modern Mexican history after you know, years and years of, of corruption and voter fraud and so on. Um, you know, there's the images of AMLO uh, on election night, you know, driving his entourage to the Zocalo to give a speech. And he's, you know, he's driving at a, at a walking pace because so many people have rushed out into the streets to, to see him, to embrace him, right? It's, uh, you know, widely perceived this huge political moment. And he himself that night would say, you know, he's going to transform the country. Um, and what I still think was the only honest thing he said, and he kept repeating, he was like, I want to go down in history as a good president. Um, but he repeated his commitment to Ayotzinapa. He stood with the families on the anniversary of the attacks, the fourth anniversary, so September 26, 2018, he was then president-elect. He repeated his commitment to find, I mean, his commitment was not, we're gonna look into it. His commitment was, we will find your sons. We will find the truth of everything that happened and we will bring the perpetrators to justice. He was not mild uh, in, in the nature of the commitment, the explicit nature of the commitment he was making. His fourth day in office on December 4th, 2018, he issued a decree to establish a truth commission for human rights, uh, explicitly and exclusively for the Ayotzinapa case. So then 
the case just kind of dropped off the media radar screens once again. I would see the parents in the marches. The, the parents have been marching every month in Mexico City since their children were disappeared, literally every month, every 26th. They march in Mexico City. Every 27th, they march in Iguala, um, in addition to countless other acts of, of social organizing they're involved in. Um, but you know, I would see them here at the marches, and they started getting really anxious and really upset. They felt like the president uh, was dragging his feet, that they, were, they, they would meet once a month initially with the president, and nothing new would have happened. Then they would start canceling those meetings. And then in June, of um, 2019, uh, so this is months later, uh, a video was leaked to the press showing then federal police officer uh, Arrieta, Gomez Arrieta, torturing a man and interrogating him in October 2014 about the disappeared students. The man's tape face had been completely covered in tape from like uh, you know his his top lip up to the top of his head, uh, so obviously he couldn't see anything, um, and he was being administered electric shocks to his neck um, as they were interrogating him. Standing behind him, there is a uniformed Marine officer, um, other federal police and federal investigative agents. So this video was leaked. At the time, Arrieta was the chief of, of state security in Michoacan. So whoever leaked this, obviously, I don't think, sadly, that they were interested in justice for victims of torture, or the case of Ayotzinapa. They were trying to destroy this person's political career, which they did, of course. Um, the next day, Arrieta resigned, and within days, he was arrested. Days later, AMLO once again issues a decree and the decree establishes the special uh, investigative unit for the Ayotzinapa case inside the federal attorney general's office. One of the constant, one of the very bizarre arcane features of the Mexican justice system is that they divide different cases into different crimes into different jurisdictions. And so with the Ayotzinapa case, you had some people who, for example, had been murdered that night and their cases were in the state of Tamaulipas or the, you know, the, the disappearances which the former government refused to call disappearance, only called them kidnappings, um, was in Tamaulipas. And another case would be in the state of Nayarit, and another case would be in Mexico State. And so this is something that you know, activists for years and concretely here, the families and the experts are saying, hey, this is a kind of administrative torture for uh, families and victims, um, and for obviously people who are, who are uh, potentially falsely accused and or have to mount some kind of a defense. So one thing that this decree did was it finally united all the different uh, crimes into one jurisdiction in one investigative unit. So everything related to Ayotzinapa, which included forced disappearance, which included torture, which included lies and, and uh, all kinds of administrative actions involved in the cover-up, um, and which included uh, organized crime. Uh, because of the, the potential link to organized crime and the motive for the attack, um, were all brought under this newly created investigative unit. I, I mentioned the dates because once again, like you'd want to think that these governments, these governments react when things happen in the press. So there's this absolutely scandalous torture video and they rush to get the decree, which they'd already been working on. It was a part of the, you know, the representatives of the families and the human rights groups had been pushing. And of course the experts opinion years before had been pushing for bringing the entire Yotsunapa case into one investigative unit inside the federal attorney general's office. But they actually finally did it, like whipped it out within days of this hideous scandalous torture video being released to the press. Once again, after, uh, oh, and they name Omar Gomez Trejo, to be the uh, head prosecutor of this newly created special investigative unit. That was something that for the families and for the human rights organizations, for a lot of people who've been following the case was actually a ray of something like hope. Omar Gomez Trejo is someone who comes from a, a human rights background. He's a lawyer, Mexican, trained in Mexico, worked for the United Nations uh, Office of Human Rights, for several years, had worked in Honduras, had worked in Guatemala, 
before he took a job with the expert commission, the HIE, as their, they kind of invented the job title, uh, Secretario Tecnico, but pretty much as their main guy in Mexico, like a guy doing all kinds of stuff. I you know, collaborated with him on several things uh, during those years of the HIE. Um, and so here's someone who has a human rights background, is a lawyer, and has direct and explicit knowledge of the case. He'd worked with the HIE, and after, when the HIE had to leave the country, he had to leave the country too, and actually spent a couple, I think it was about, you know, sometime in Central America, and then a year and a half or so in Washington, D.C., at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, still working on the case, what was then called the Mecanismo de Seguimiento, or the, you know, um, follow-up mechanism inside the Inter-American Commission. So here's someone with real knowledge of the case, um, which is why people thought that that appointment um, was a good sign, was very serious, and was a sign that maybe something, maybe a real investigation would happen. Um, so then the pandemic hits, of course, right? Um, it turns out during the pandemic, this special investigative unit kept working, but there was real, there were no real main kind of media events associated with the investigation. You know, the, the investigation was cranking on. In 2020 as well, the HIE, this you know, independent expert group, was invited back to Mexico and started offering their technical assistance again. So starting in 2020, yeah, starting in 2020, you now have this special investigative unit inside the Federal Attorney General's office, the Truth Commission that the president set up in 2018, and the independent expert group, the HIE, all supposedly working together. And 2020, 2021, 2021, there are a couple of weird leaks to the press coming from this Truth Commission, some weird stuff. Don't have time to go into it, unfortunately, because I'm already way over time. 2022, and this is supposedly what I want to talk about tonight, um, 40 minutes later, sorry. Uh, in 2022, in February, the HIE releases their third report, the first report with this new government, right? And in this third report, once again, they have intensely um, revelatory information. They were able, after you know, knocking on doors and knocking on doors, the army to, been trying to get access to army documents for years since the very beginning, right? The first government wouldn't let them, wouldn't let them interview any army soldiers, wouldn't let them access the army bases, wouldn't let them access any documentation, denied the existence of documentation, produced and turned in completely falsified documentation, including, for example, a map of that night with four buses instead of five. Um, the fifth bus, interestingly missing from that map. Um, but so the president kept saying, to the army publicly, you have to let these people review all the documents. You have to let them review all the documents. But even then they wouldn't, and it would just be this going back and forth until finally in meetings with the president, the family members, the human rights lawyers, the HIE group, the representatives of the armed forces and the Marines, all in the same room, the president would be like, you have to let them in. So finally they let them in to a handful of documents. And these people are really, serious good investigators. And they found military documents that the military had been denying that existed the whole time along. The military documents show, these are again, uh, kind of repeat and, and overemphasize documents retrieved from military archives with you know, official military stamps and signatures all over them. These are official military documents showing that the army had been surveilling the students for years. All of that surveillance pertained to counterinsurgency and to political activity, none of it to anything to having to do with drug trafficking. Um, that they had been surveilling them in the weeks prior to the attacks. They knew everything about what the students they were doing. They knew that they were planning to go to the October 2nd March in Mexico City, that they promised to gather a whole bunch of commandeered buses so that all the teachers' colleges across the country, the rural teachers' colleges, could gather at Ayotzinapa and go in a caravan to Mexico City. They had quotes from the meetings that the students had held where they decided to uh, volunteer to be the school that would gather all these buses because it turns out in these military documents, the army had undercover military agents infiltrated at the school. They, these military documents themselves describe as la fachada de estudiante, right? So the like, the, you know, the ruse of being a student, the, like the, 
the, the disguise of being a student. They had military intelligence agents inside the school. They had military intelligence agents in the neighboring town of Tixla. And of course they had military intelligence agents in Iguala where they've got two major army bases, the 27th Battalion and the 41st Battalion. Um, so now you have this documentation because you know, the army the whole time be like, we did, had been saying, we don't know, we didn't know, we didn't know anything was going on, we didn't see, that's why we didn't go out on the street, we didn't intervene, we had nothing to do with it. But the we didn't know is completely unsustainable because the army documents themselves show that they knew absolutely everything in real time from multiple angles and multiple perspectives through military intelligence agents, through the army soldier who was operating security cameras in the city of Iguala that night. This is now documented. This is not up for debate, right? That that person himself has even got a document now that was recovered describing how he operated the cameras. Um, uh, and it, it even turns out they found in these documents that the army had tapped the cell phones of a number of local members of organized crime in Iguala and were listening to their conversations and receiving their messages while they were attacking and disappearing the students. They found documentation of this. These are wiretaps for which there's no judicial uh, justification in the case, in the file. It's just the transcripts. And it, the documents that they found, unfortunately, are not complete. They found pieces of these documents, right? Or like, you know, I mean, not pieces, they find a complete document, but a complete document for one day, and then three days would be missing, and then there'd be another day, and so on. So, of course, they requested that the Army turn in the full documentation. The Army continues to claim that that documentation does not exist. and just says no. Um, but uh, one other super, well, two other super important things that the HIE found, they showed the government first in February of 2022 in a, in a report that was only delivered privately to the government and to the families um, and only publicly made known in a summarized version later in March. They had 60 videos of torture of 50 detainees. These people were tortured in federal installations, both federal attorney general's office, offices as well as Marine bases. You've got uniformed Marines visible in the torture sessions participating. You've got members of the, the Mexican CIA, basically called CISEN at the time, um, participating in the torture. They're the ones who filmed the torture. Um, a number of different high level federal officials involved in the investigation participating in the torture. Tomas Hernando Lucio, Walvoto Ramirez. Um, so again, now there was, there was video documentation produced by the torturers themselves that had been recovered to show the extent of torture used to produce all the false confessions for the historical truth or Vida Historica. And probably perhaps most damning or equally as damning, they found CDs with video footage from a Marine drone. This is a drone that can be based in Mexico City that can only be flown by the president or the secretary of the Marines, like the chief of the Marines flying over the Kukula trash dump at 6.30 in the morning on October 27th. October 27th is two days before the federal government supposedly officially travels to this trash dump to discover the remains and the batch plastic bags by the River Nevega. Two days before that event, which is so exhaustively documented in the case file and so on, the Marines went there at six in the morning they filmed themselves doing it. And this, this drone footage has been recovered and made public. They arrive, they un, you see them unloading things from their marine trucks. You see them pulling things out of bags or boxes. You see them setting things on fire and fires burning. You see them moving objects down to the bottom of the trash dump, taking stuff up, moving it down, taking stuff up. You see them then a group of Marines walking around, kicking the dirt and kicking stuff around. You see the clouds of dust rise up. You see the fire get put out. You see the federal attorney general at the time, Jesus Murillo Karam, arrive sometime around eight in the morning and oversee everything that's going on. He's there with Tomas Heron de Lucio, who's now a uh, fugitive in Israel. You see them orchestrating this thing. At one point, it's, it's really, it's so expensive. 
a Marine, they, all the cars move back. The whole convoy of Marines and federal police and federal agents move back. A, a Marine helicopter comes, the drone goes up. The Marine helicopter lowers down into the trash dump, of course, creating a colossal mess, doesn't land and just flies off. Literally, they used a helicopter to like plant their false crime scene. Like it, it, they, the Hie found Marine official drone footage of the setting of the stage of the mass cover up itself. So this is February, 2022. And this is obviously like, What you're now seeing is like just irrefutable evidence that not only did police from three levels, from all three levels of government and soldiers collaborate to murder, mutilate, and forcibly disappear 43 college students in September of 2014. But then the federal attorney general, the president's office, the Marines, the army, the full structure of the security apparatus and the administrative apparatus of the state jumped in to torture, to lie, and to create a false story. Which again, because we're talking about forced disappearance, itself is constitutive of perpetuating the nightmare, the hell, the torture of these families who are looking for their children is constitutive itself of the forced disappearance. It's the administrative stage. So now you have this, you had, I mean, it's just been piling and piling and piling the irrefutable evidence of the extent to which uh, the state and the armed forces, both the army and the Marines were involved in all this. So in June, a couple months later, June 30th, AMLO in his morning press conference out of nowhere says, uh, or no, a reporter asks him something about Yosinapa, and he says, we're about to you know, release something. We now know what happened. You know, we're taking our time and making sure everything's da, 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 but we now know what happened. And we'll we'll be, you know, we'll be solving it very soon. The reporter says, Will you have time in your in your administration, your six-year term? And he's like, Ayotzinapa will be solved by the end of the year, 2022. The very next day, of course, the parents of the 43 disappeared children, young men, pulled a press conference saying, what is this? What does he mean he knows? He hasn't met with us. He hasn't told us anything. We don't know anything about this. In fact, I'll, I'll read a brief translation of what one of the, one of the fathers said. Um, because, you know, Amlo said, si, ya sabemos lo que sucedió. You know, we now know exactly what, we now know what happened. The next day, the father said, this is torment. This is inhuman. We who are here waiting for some kind of an answer to know about where our children are. Um, and this senor walking around bragging that he already knows. What is this attitude? Um, why has he not wanted to meet with us? Right? So this really struck out for a lot of people. Obviously, the families first and foremost. They're like, what's going on? Like something, otra vez, it seemed like to San Tramando, right? They're, they're orchestrating something. This kind of a, you know, lead out into the press. And so uh, months go by. And then in mid-August, the Truth Commission announced it would hold a press conference. It was August um, 17th. They canceled it the last minute and then held it the next day, August 18th. And at the press conference, they present a report, and the report has a lot of information that had already been published by the HIE in their third report. But then oddly, like half of this very slim report, it's about 90 pages, very large font, about half of it, 40 something pages, uh, were like images of screen captures from what's up that had all been redacted, all been blacked out. So you couldn't read the context uh, the, or the content of who we're sending the messages, what the numbers were, much of the much of the text itself, most of the text itself. Um, but in the press conference, they described that these were WhatsApp messages between perpetrators and one perpetrator and a partner um, describing everything that happened. Um, 
And, you know, they talked about a group of the students having been alive for several days after the initial attacks. Um, they talked about a few soldiers being involved, um, but they repeated this old version that there was a confusion, you know, the students were confused for a rival drug cartel, and that's what led to everything, and it got out of hand. Um, but what happened is that the story didn't make sense. It didn't seem to fit with this immense accumulating amount of documentation about state actions. Um, and no one knew about the existence of this report. The special investigative unit, the, like the actual legally tasked investigators of the crime, Omar Gomez Trejo and his entire team, had no knowledge of that report. The members of the HIE, who were the, tech, the family's technical assistants appointed by the Inter-American Commission of the United States, had no knowledge of that report. And that was really weird because up until then, they'd been sharing everything. For example, the videos that they were able to get of the torture session, those were shared between everybody and nobody leaked them to the press. Nobody uh, you know, put out any kind of a report before somebody else. So there's this track record of these three different entities completely sharing information. When the HIE got all of these military documents, they shared them with the Truth Commission. They shared them with the, uh, the special investigator. And then all of a sudden there's this report coming out of nowhere that nobody'd seen, that nobody knew what was going on. And there are these WhatsApp messages that are being blacked out. Nobody knows what's going on. And immediately, like maybe soy muy mal pensado, or I'm like verging on cynical or something, but immediately I thought it's another trash dump. Like, this is too weird. It doesn't make sense. Why are they going to share everything and then all of a sudden not share something? And what they don't share are these supposed WhatsApp messages. It turns out that the members of Guerrero Unidos, who were actually coordinating drug trafficking activities and so on, all used Blackberries. The DEA wiretaps uh, of, of these Guerrero Unidos members, both in Chicago and in Mexico, were all Blackberries. And there were all these sh like really short coded text messages. And all of a sudden you have these WhatsApp messages that are written almost like novels with first and last names and saying, now we're gonna take the students with this person and this person over here to this location, right? And it just seemed really weird. The next day, the federal attorney general, the first you know, original federal attorney general when the attacks happened, Jesus Mario Cobb was arrested in Mexico City. The day after that, the judge scolded the lawyers uh, who were presenting the case against him for not having any clue of what was in their own case file. Then Omar Gomez Trejo was in Israel because he had gone to try and negotiate the extradition of Tomas Heron de Lucio, who's fugitive there. Mexico and Israel have no extradition treaty. So they're going to like kind of lobby for this to happen, presenting the case against Tomas Heron de Lucio for torture, for uh, forced disappearance, for uh, obfuscation of justice in the case. Um, and he's out of the office right when the probably highest profile political figure in the history of this atrocity is being arrested, it all just, once again, it just seems weird, right? It doesn't make sense. Omar comes back. It turns out that all the investigative police for the special investigators unit, uh, the Federal Attorney General's office, were sent away. They were all removed. So now they had no detectives um, to continue their investigative work. The Federal Attorney General, Gertz Manero, sent an internal audit into the special investigative unit uh, out of nowhere. Like this thing's been uh, in existence since June of 2019. And just as all this stuff is happening, they send an internal audit. Eyewitnesses would later tell me, and the HIE would publish it later in their fourth report, that this internal audit went straight to the 83 arrest warrants that had also been submitted on August 19th, the day that uh, Murillo Karam was arrested. And that as soon as they found the document with these uh, arrest warrants and the, you know, the justifications before the judge for the arrest warrants, they just went in here. Um, what would happen is within days, Omar Gomez Trejo would resign. Within days of that, pretty much all of his he prosecutors and investigators would all resign. 
uh, Omar would, would, would leave the country. Um, and an po old political friend of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador from Tabasco with zero human rights experience. Like Omar had been, you know, working with the UN, working with the HIA, working with the Inter-American Inter Commission on Human Rights, precisely on Ayotzinapa for years. They send in a guy from Tabasco who's never worked on a single case of torture, forced disappearance, of human rights. And within the space of like a month, a month and a half from this first presenting of this weird report, the entire independent investigative unit had been blown apart. And the president questioned about this in press conferences would say, first off, he would acknowledge that he met with the federal attorney general, with the head of the Supreme Court, um, with the subsecretary for human rights, the head of the Truth Commission, Alejandro Encinas, and the Secretary of the Gobernación to talk about the future of the case. That meeting, it turns out, was three days before the Truth Commission's report was released in a press conference to the public. And AMLO would also say, this Truth Commission report is my Truth Commission's report. This is what we're going to base everything on. So I've sent this Truth Commission's report to the Federal Attorney General's office, and that's what they're gonna focus on. So you had, oh, sorry about this, a couple of really key bits of information. Within days of uh, Muriel Karam's arrest, Omar going to Israel and coming back, Lopez Obrador announced that he was going to move the newly created National Guard, which is the militarized federal police force, directly into the Secretary of National Defense. So consummating the absolute, like just uh, not even lit metaphorical, but literal militarization of the federal police um, by moving the National Guard into the Secretary of National Defense. Um, and, of those 83 arrest warrants that were issued the same day that Murillo Karam was arrested, the internal affairs people who had, were ostensibly carrying out an audit of the special investigator's office um, rescinded 21 arrest warrants, sent a note to the judge to cancel 21 of these arrest warrants. Of these arrest warrants, 15 were against members of the Mexican army, soldiers, and others were against the former, high level former officials in, in Guerrero State. Um, and so you have, you know, this truth commission report coming out, the disarticulation of the special investigative unit itself, the rescinding of, you know, a quarter of the arrest warrants of that investigative unit's initial work. And the president's kind of insisting that this truth commission's report as you know, what we're gonna follow. One last thing real quick, turns out that when the HIA was able to get access to the digital files that were supposedly the source for these screen captures um, that consisted in the new evidence of the truth commission's report, and submitted them to an independent forensics analysis. The independent forensics analysis said, none of these images can be verified as legitimate. They do, cannot be considered constitutive of evidence in a trial. Um, and they noticed, which actually the first person noticed, I spoke to was one of human rights lawyers who told me, did you notice even looking in the redacted images, a couple of these WhatsApp, or one in particular, these WhatsApp uh, screen captures has a double blue check double blue tick. It's very easy to Google and find out that the double blue tick on WhatsApp did not exist in September, October of 2014. That was initially brought out in the US a month later in November, mid-November. The double blue tick, I don't use WhatsApp, but it, it's what you see when someone has read your message, right? At some point you send your message, there's a gray tick or something like that. And once they've read it, there's a double blue tick. So here's this screen capture of a supposed WhatsApp message sent on the night of September 26, 2014 with a double blue tick, which didn't exist in 2014. Excuse so you me, have- 
John, you've given us such a wealth of information and uh, thought-provoking material. I'm sure everybody's dying to ask you some questions. Uh, I wonder if we could, you know, um, uh, more some questions course. and then go back and forth a little bit. Of course, of course. If you have some last things you want to get in. No, that was just, believe it or not, trying to round it up, but just to that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, totally. Any Any questions? We'll go, we'll ask Jen. I know there's a couple of questions there and she she can get them out to you. And others, please feel free to ask your questions on chat. Jennifer? Yes, yeah, sorry, technical. <laughs> Two computers. No problem. Okay. Um, we have a question from Mark Wenzel. Um, he'd like to understand how the U.S. might be involved in these mass kidnappings and disappearances. Where are the weapons coming from to commit these acts of terror? Absolutely. Um, well, it turns out a lot of the weapons used concretely in the acts of terror committed in Iguala against the students came from Germany. Um, others came from the United States. Um, and there's a there's a, a a case against the Mexican government in in Germany for the use of those weapons um, by police and military during those attacks. But in in a broader sense, um, how is the U.S. involved? I mean, first off, I just think. It's very important to recall that the entire edifice of the US war on drugs is itself a mass atrocity of impossible to calculate scale. It's initiated in you know, 71, expanded with Reagan in the 80s. The, the US policy of the so-called war on drugs has been a form of mass violence and oppression, both internally in the United States, highly racialized form of violence, and hemispherically and regionally. And, and it's, it's really in the, the context and the marketplace of the war on drugs that this particular kind of mass atrocity takes place. I, I absolutely think that um, what an exhaustive documentation of the attacks against the students of Ayotzinapa in Iguala that night show is the absolute fusion of state security forces and organized crime in the, in the transnational heroin industry. Um, no matter what exactly sparked the attacks, um, you know, there's, I still think the most solid hypothesis is that precisely this fifth bus was one of the buses, which they already know, they sent out every Friday night, September 26th was a Friday night from Iguala towards the United States. I think it's highly probable that um, that that the students unknowingly commandeered a bus that had been retrofitted for a major heroin shipment, um, and but in, okay, if if that's the case, it should strike one as just mind-boggling that who is called to recover the, the the drugs? The cops, right? But not just any cops. Cops from three cities: state police, federal police, the army. And then not only that, but then the entire weight of the state is going to jump into gear to make it impossible to see precisely that, to protect, hence, the drug trafficking industry and not students and their families. Um, I mean, I, I mean and, and regardless of whether or not that particular bus was retrofitted, what the actual attacks themselves show is precisely that fusion and that uh, interpenetration, right? The, the constant coordination between the army, between the federal state and these local police with cartel enforcers or, or ununiformed uh, people in the employ of the heroin industry. Um, they all worked together that night. Um, and, and yeah, so I think U.S. involvement in, in a very grand scale, kind of macro scale through this continued mass um imposition of the war on drugs is is huge i also think the dea had these people wiretapped 
for a case they were working on in Illinois. They knew also in real time what was going on. And what did the US government do? Obama received Peña Nieto at the White House in November of 2014. So they were disappearing the students. And the DEA knew that it was the state that was doing it. They had all the information right there. You know, so yes, there's, I don't know. I just, I think, how, how can you justify uh, having access to that information and, and not doing anything with it? I don't know. If there's another yeah. question. Yes, we have another question. Um, you elaborate on why the military and the state have felt so threatened by rural normal schools and what this says about the real structures of power in Mexico. I think um, even even though we've talked about um, you know this this fusion of, of state security forces and organized crime and how the attacks are related to uh, their activities in the transnational heroin shipment industry, illegal industry. Also, I think the part of the content of the violence, when the decision is made to forcibly disappear these students, when the decision is made to cut the face off of one of the abducted students, murder him and deposit his body on the side of a small trash dump in Iguala. When the decisions are made for that kind of cruelty, that there is a race, class and counterinsurgency dimension to the violence. That, that particular violence is very much against those students. Um, and I mean, there's the long context and history of loathing and hatred of, as the person who asked the question, rightly um, indicates rural people and rural people who organize to defend their land and their territory and their way of life, rural people who don't want to become migrants or drug traffickers or, or, or um, wage laborers in cities, but rural people who actually want to be rural people, right? And live on the land and farm and, uh, and sustain their way of life. Um, the, the rural teachers' colleges themselves are born out of a, of a revolutionary fervor and history to tailor a particular kind of education for rural communities by rural people. A lot of these students, for example, you know, are, are native indigenous language speakers, Nahuatl or um, Tonsavi in, in Guerrero. Um, and I, I interviewed a, a MEPA speaker who, who told me that the reason he wanted to go to Ayotzinapa and study there was because he wanted to be an elementary school teacher in his community who speaks the native language. He told me, this is in 2014, that in his hometown, they'd never had a teacher that spoke their, their native language, right? That should blow the mind. Like in the year 2014, children going to school and they still can't speak their native language. Um, and so his, the whole reason he went to Ayotzinapa was to get a degree and, be able to be, you know, an elementary school teacher who also speaks the native language of the region, which is Nepa. And so um, I think that still like rural people, indigenous people, indigenous people organizing and who uh, not only organize to defend community and territory, but also have an intensely critical perspective on the neoliberal, you know, broad uh, impetus of the state's policies last several decades um, are are perceived as enemies um, and are treated as um, I mean are treated with utmost cruelty um, and and I think that that that's an important part of what happens that um, that I think the content of the violence the nature of the particular cruelty exercised against the students was in part um, the state's uh, uh, and still just fierce animosity towards 
uh, towards that particular school and the students and, and what they represent nationally. Um, there's a question, it did come more at the beginning. I'd like to get a sense of what the pathway is for Mexico to have a more robust governance system. And Clark, if you'd like to elaborate or anything, please. Oh, I, I feel intensely unqualified to answer that question. Um, I, I think, I mean, the best I can do is, is draw attention to Mexican social movements and to the, um, you know, the, uh, the ideas that they're producing. I mean, uh, you know, just to name one of, for me, one of the most influential uh, movements in, in contemporary Mexico for, for several years or decades now, the Zapatistas in, in Chiapas who produced an incredible amount of thought um, you know, communiques and stories and uh, seminars with an overwhelming amount of thought available uh, in video form, uh, text form, and audio um, on their website in Las Zapatista. Um, and, and a large amount of that, a large amount of that is translated into multiple languages, including English. Um, but I really think the like the the spirit of that question is excellent, but it's I would recommend kind of gearing it towards um, you know Mexican social movements. Um, one of the the most for me kind of devastating but also powerful social movements of recent years is precisely the family members have disappeared in Mexico and the ways in which not only the Ayotzinapa families but but people across the country, particularly women mostly women, not exclusively, but mostly, um, organize to search for their loved ones. And in so doing, become, you know, forensics anthropologists and detectives and social organizers and fundraisers and, uh, you know, psychotherapists for each other. Like, they, it, it's amazing the amount and intense nature of knowledge that these people, mostly women, um, uh, cultivate amongst themselves initially at this kind of, you know, just fervent love drive to find their family members, their loved ones. Um, but also very quickly, they become incredibly savvy and astute political analysts because, you know, as, every time they go to some kind of a state official and ask them to do their job um, and they're met with violence and they're met with, um, uh, insults and they're met with foot dragging and they're met with uh, arrogance and aggression, um, they very quickly and forcibly and terrifyingly have to gain a quick and astute analysis of what's going on with governance. Um, so I think also looking into, there's a lot of documentaries and, um, and reporting that's been done on the families looking for the disappeared. They're the collectives that have formed all over the country. All and it's, I guess it's it's kind of devastating because, like small towns, cities, like across the country, that twenty years ago there wasn't a single person who'd been disappeared from those communities, those towns, those cities, and now they have collectives of family members, mostly women, uh, looking for the hundreds who have been disappeared just in those towns. Um, John, um, we want to thank you for this really um, encyclopedic uh, um, rendering of what has happened and what hasn't happened in this investigation since 2014. And um, I, I, for one, would like to read your book um, now. I, I can see that your attention to, you, you've lived this, you've really lived it, you're, uh, and, and in the, in the name of, of human rights and caring about those families. Uh, many of those family members did come to Ann Arbor for everyone um, who's on. Um, 
I, I don't recall the year, but either one or two years after it happened and they spoke on our campus here and um, several of us were, were heard them speak. And I think one of the main takeaways from tonight is that this was a horrific and large scale and very covered up um, incident or set of incidences. Um, but it's just part of a pattern of so many disappearances. And in fact, so many mass graves across Mexico that that's why they could find one to say, oh, they, they, they were buried in this mass grave because there are so many. Um, and um, what we do know, and it's much more complex than I'm going to say in these few minutes, but um, that the United States is funding and arming and training um, the Mexican military and police and cooperating with them in all of their intelligence endeavors, et cetera. And um, so this is not just something that's, you know, happening in Mexico. It's, um, we are uh, connected with that, we as United States citizens. And I think we're gonna have to leave it there for tonight. Um, I really thank, first of all, John for being with us um, and for such a, a comprehensive presentation. And thanks to all of you for, for coming and for staying with us. Um, and we hope to see all of you again and we will be in touch in all the ways that we know how to do um, to let you know what uh, other things will be happening um, coming out of the Latin America caucus of ICPJ. So bid good night to everybody. Thank you so much.